Chapter 19 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 19. Comparison of Results. Let us now bring our scattered results side to side for the purpose of comparison, and judge of the extent to which they corroborate one another, how far they confirm the provisional calculations made in the chapter on judges from more scanty data, and where and why they contrast. The number of cases of hereditary genius analysed in the several chapters of my book amount to a large total. I have dealt with no less than 300 families, containing between them nearly 1,000 eminent men, of whom 415 are illustrious, or at all events, of such note as to deserve being printed in black type at the head of a paragraph. If there be such a thing as a decided law of distribution of genius in families, it is sure to become manifest when we deal statistically with so large a body of examples. In comparing the results obtained from the different groups of eminent men, it will be our most convenient course to compare the columns upper B of the several tables. Column upper B gives the number of kinsmen in various degrees, on the supposition that the number of families in the group to which it refers is 100. All the entries under B have therefore the same common measure. They are all percentages, and admit of direct intercomparison. I hope I have made myself quite clear, lest there should remain any misapprehension, it is best to give an example. Thus, the families of divines are only twenty-five in number, and in those twenty-five families there are seven eminent fathers, nine brothers and ten sons. Now, in order to raise these numbers to percentages, seven, nine, and ten must be multiplied by the number of times that twenty-five goes into one hundred, namely by four. They will then become 28, 36, and 40, and will be found entered as such in column B, page 275, the parent numbers 7, 9, 10, appearing in the same table in the column A. In the following table, the columns B of all the different groups are printed side by side. I have, however, thrown painters and musicians into a single group of artists, because their numbers were too small to make it worthwhile to consider them apart. A table is displayed on the page with three main columns descending, titled The Number of Families is Containing More Than One Eminent, and the Total Number of Eminent Men in All the Families, Separate Groups, and All Groups Together. And next to these is a column B, calculated from the whole of the families put together, with the intention of giving a general average, and I have further attached to it its appropriate columns C and D, not so much for particular use in this chapter as for the convenience of the reader who may wish to make comparisons with the other tables from the different point of view which d affords the general uniformity in the distribution of ability among the kinsmen in the different groups is strikingly manifest the eminent sons are almost invariably more numerous than the eminent brothers and these are a trifle more numerous than the eminent fathers on proceeding further down the table we come to a sudden dropping off of the numbers at the second grade of kinship, namely at the grandfathers, uncles, nephews, and grandsons. This diminution is conspicuous in the entries in column D, the meaning of which has already been fully described in page 81-83. to 83. On reaching the third grade of kinship, another abrupt dropping off in numbers is again met with, but the first cousins are found to occupy a decidedly better position than other relations within the third grade. We further observe that while the proportionate abundance of eminent kinsmen in the various grades is closely similar in all the groups, the proportions deduced from the entire body of illustrious men, 415 in number, coincide with peculiar general accuracy with those we obtained from a large subdivision of 109 judges. There cannot, therefore, remain a doubt as to the existence of a law of distribution of ability in families, or that it is pretty accurately expressed by the figures in column B, under the heading of eminent men of all classes. I do not, however, think it worth while to submit a diagram like that in page 83, derived from the column D in the last table, because little dependence can be placed on the entries in C, by the help of which that column had to be calculated. When I began my inquiries, I did indeed try to obtain real and not estimated data for C, by inquiring into the total numbers of kinsmen in each degree, of every illustrious man, as well as of those who achieved eminence. I wearied myself for a long time with searching biographies, but finding the results very disproportionate to the labour, and continually open to doubt after they had been obtained. I gave up the task, and resigned myself to the rough but ready method of estimating averages. It is earnestly to be desired that breeders of animals would furnish tables, like mine, on the distribution of different marked physical qualities in families. 
the results would be far more than mere matters of curiosity and would afford constants or formulae by which i shall briefly show in a subsequent chapter the laws of heredity as they are now understood may admit of being expressed in contrasting the columns b of the different groups the first notable peculiarity that catches the eye is the small number of the sons of commanders they being thirty one while the average of all the groups is forty eight there is nothing anomalous in this irregularity i have already shown when speaking of the commanders that they usually begin their active careers in youth and therefore if married at all they are mostly away from their wives on military service it is also worth while to point out a few particular cases where exceptional circumstances stood in the way of the commanders leaving male issue because the total number of those included in my lists is so small being only thirty two as to make them of appreciable importance in affecting the results thus alexander the great was continually engaged in distant wars and died in early manhood he had one posthumous son but that son was murdered for political reasons when still a boy julius caesar an exceedingly profligate man left one illegitimate son by cleopatra but that son was also murdered for political reasons when still a boy nelson married a widow who had no children by her former husband and therefore was probably more or less infertile by nature napoleon I was entirely separated from mary louise after she had borne him one son though the great commanders have but few immediate descendants yet the number of their eminent grandsons is as great as in the other groups i ascribe this to the superiority of their breed which ensures eminence to an unusually large proportion of their kinsmen the next exceptional entry in the table is the number of eminent fathers of the great scientific men as compared with that of their sons there being only twenty six of the former to sixty of the latter whereas the average of all the groups gives thirty one and forty eight i have already attempted to account for this by showing first that scientific men owe much to the training and to the blood of their mothers and secondly that the first in the family who has scientific gifts is not nearly so likely to achieve eminence as the descendant who is taught to follow science as a profession and not to waste his powers on pointless speculations the next peculiarity in the table is the small number of eminent fathers in the group of poets this group is too small to make me attach much importance to the deviation it may be mere accident the artists are not a much larger group than the poets consisting as they do of only twenty-eight families but the number of their eminent sons is enormous and quite exceptional it is eighty-nine whereas the average of all the groups is only forty-eight the remarks i made about the descendant of a great scientific man prospering in science more than his ancestor are eminently true as regards artists for the fairly gifted son of a great painter or musician is far more likely to become a professional celebrity than another man who has equal natural ability but is not especially educated for professional life the large number of artists sons who have become eminent testifies to the strongly hereditary character of their peculiar ability while if the reader will turn to the account of the herschel family page two hundred fifteen two hundred sixteen he will readily understand that many persons may have decided artistic gifts who have adopted some other more regular solid or lucrative occupation i have now done with the exceptional cases it will be observed that they are mere minor variations in the law expressed by the general average of all the groups for if we say that every ten illustrious men who have any eminent relations at all we find three or four eminent fathers four or five eminent brothers and five or six eminent sons we shall be right in seventeen instances out of twenty-four and in the seven cases where we are wrong the error will consist of less than one unit in two cases the fathers are the commanders and men of literature of one unit in four cases the father of poets and the sons of judges commanders and divines and of more than one unit in the sole case of the sons of artists the deviations from the average are generally greater in the second and third grades of kinship because the numbers of instances in the several groups are generally small but as the proportions in the large subdivision of the eighty-five judges correspond with extreme closeness to those of the general average we are perfectly justified in accepting the latter with confidence the final and most important result remains to be worked out it is this if we know nothing else about a person than that he is a father brother son grandson or other relation of an illustrious man what is the chance that he is or will be eminent column e in page sixty one gives the reply for judges it remains for us to discover what it is for illustrious men generally in each of the chapters i have given such data as i possessed fit for combining with the results in column d in order to make the required calculation they consist of the proportion of men whose relations achieved eminence compared with the total number into whose relationships are inquired 
the general result is that exactly one half of the illustrious men have one or more eminent relations consequently if we divide the entries in column d of eminent men of all classes page three hundred and seventeen by two we shall obtain the corresponding column e the reader may however suspect the fairness of my selection he may recollect my difficulty avowed in many chapters of finding suitable selections and will suspect that i have yielded to the temptation of inserting more than a due share of favourable cases and i cannot wholly deny the charge for i can recollect a few names that probably occur to me owing to the double or triple weight given to them by the culminated performances of two or three persons therefore i acknowledge it to be quite necessary in the interests of truth to appeal to some wholly independent selection of names and will take for that purpose the saints or whatever their right name may be of the comtist calendar many of my readers will know to what i am referring how august comte desiring to found a religion of humanity selected a list of names from those to whom human development was most indebted and assigned the months to the most important the weeks to the next class and the days to the third i have nothing whatever to do with the comtist doctrines in these pages his disciples disliked darwinism and therefore cannot be expected to be favourable to many of the discussions in this book so i have the more satisfaction in the independence of the testimony afforded by his calendar to the truth of my views again no one can doubt that comte's selections are entirely original for he was the last man to pin his faith upon that popular opinion which he aspired to lead every name in his calendar was weighed we may be sure with scrupulous care though i dare say with a rather crazy balance before it was inserted in the place which he assigned for it in his calendar the calendar consists of thirteen months each containing four weeks the following table gives the representatives of the thirteen months in capital letters and those of the fifty-two weeks in ordinary type i have not thought it worth while to transcribe the representatives of the several days those marked with a star are included in my appendices as having eminent relations those with a plus might have been so included it will be observed that there are from ten to twenty persons of whose kinships we know nothing or next to nothing and therefore they should be struck out of the list such as numa buddha homer phidias thales pythagoras archimedes apollinus hipparchus st paul among the remaining fifty-five or forty-five persons no less than twenty-seven or one-half have eminent relations one theocracy initial plus moses numa buddha plus confucius mahomet two ancient poetry homer plus aeschylus phidias plus aristophanes virgil three ancient philosophy star aristotle thales pythagoras socrates plato four ancient science archimedes plus hippocrates apollinus hipparchus star pliny the elder five military civilization star caesar themistocles star alexander star scipio trajan six catholicism st paul plus st augustine hildebrand st bernard Bousset. seven feudal civilization charlemagne alfred godfrey innocent the third st louis eight modern epic dante star ariosto raphael tasso star milton nine modern industry gutenberg columbus vulcanson star watt plus montgolfier ten modern drama shakespeare calderon star corneille malayer star mozart eleven modern philosophy descartes star st thomas aquinas star lord bacon star leibnitz hume twelve modern politics frederick the great lewis eleventh star william the silent star riccolo star cromwell thirteen modern science bicat star galilei star newton lavoisier gaul it is singularly interesting to observe how strongly the results obtained from comte selection corroborate my own i am sure then we shall be within the mark we consider column d in the table page three hundred seventeen to refer to the eminent kinsmen not to the large group of illustrious and eminent men but of the more select portion of illustrious men only
and then calculate our column E by dividing the entries under D by 2. For example, I reckon the chances of kinsmen of illustrious men rising or having risen to eminence to be 15.5 to 100 in the case of fathers, 13.5 to 100 in the case of brothers, 24 to 100 in the case of sons. Or putting these in the remaining proportions into a more convenient form, we obtain the following results. In first grade, the chance of the father is 1 to 6, of each brother 1 to 7, of each son 1 to 4. In second grade, of each grandfather 1 to 25, of each uncle 1 to 40, of each nephew 1 to 40, of each grandson 1 to 29. In the third grade, the chance of each member is about 1 to 200, excepting in the case of first cousins where it is 1 to 100. The large number of eminent descendants from illustrious men must not be looked upon as expressing the results of their marriage with mediocre women, for the average ability of the wives of such men is above mediocrity. This is my strong conviction after reading very many biographies, although it clashes with a commonly expressed opinion that clever men marry silly women. It is not easy to prove my point without a considerable mass of quotations to show the estimate in which the wives of a large body of illustrious men were held by their intimate friends, but the two following arguments are not without weight. First, the lady whom a man marries is very commonly one whom he has often met in society of his own friends and therefore not likely to be a silly woman. She is also usually related to some of them and therefore has a probability of being hereditarily gifted. Secondly, as a matter of fact, a large number of eminent men marry eminent women. If the reader runs his eye through my appendices, he will find many such instances. Philip II of Magadon and Olympias, Caesar's liaison with Cleopatra, Milabro and his most able wife, Helvetius, married a charming lady whose hand was also sought by both Franklin and Turgot. August Wilhelm von Schlegel was heart and soul devoted to Madame de Stael. Necker's wife was a blue stocking of the purest hue. Robert Stevens, the learned printer, had Petronella for his wife. The Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon and the great Lord Burleigh married two of the highly accomplished daughters of Sir Anthony Cook. Every one of these names, which I have taken from the appendices of my chapters on commanders, statesmen, and literary men, are those of decidedly eminent women. They establish the existence of a tendency of like to like among intellectual men and women, and make it most probable that the marriages of illustrious men with women of classes upper A and upper D are very common. On the other hand, there is no evidence of a strongly marked antagonistic taste of clever men liking really half-witted women. A man may be conscious of serious defects in his character and select a wife to supplement what he wants. As a shy man may be attracted by a woman who has no other merits than those of a talker and a manager. Also, a young awkward philosopher may accredit the first girl who cares to show an interest in him with greater intelligence than she possesses. But these are exceptional instances. The great fact remains that able men take pleasure in the society of intelligent women, and if they can find such as would in other respects be suitable, they will marry them in preference to mediocrities. I think, therefore, that the results given in my tables, under the head of sons, should be ascribed to the marriages of men of class upper F and above, with women whose natural gifts are on the average not inferior to those of class upper B, and possibly between upper B and upper C. I will now contrast the power of the male and female lines of kinship in the transmission of ability, and for that purpose we will reduce the actual figures into percentages. As an example of the process, we may take the case of the judges. Here, as will be observed in the footnote, the actual figures correspond to the specified varieties of kinship are 41, 16, 19, 1, making a total of 77. Now I raise these to what they would be if this total were raised to 100. In short, I multiply them by 100 and divide by 77, which converts them into 53, 21, 25, 1. And these are the figures inserted in the table. The actual figures are... A table is displayed on the page, titled as The Actual Figures Are. It has several columns running down, with the corresponding letters, followed by judges, statesmen, commanders, literary, scientific, poets, artists, divines, and totals. It will be observed that the ratio of the total kinships through male and female lines is almost identical in the first five columns, namely in judges, statesmen, commanders, men of literature, and men of science, and is as 70 to 30, or more than 2 to 1. The uniformity of this ratio is evidence of the existence of a law, but it is difficult to say upon what the law depends, because the ratios are different for different varieties of kinship. Thus, 
to confine ourselves to those in the second grade which are sufficiently numerous to give averages on which dependence may be placed we find that the sum of the ratios of upper g upper u upper n upper p to those of lower g lower u lower n lower p is also a little more than two to one now the actual figures are as follow twenty one upper g twenty three upper u forty upper n twenty six upper p equals one hundred and ten in all twenty one lower g sixteen lower u ten lower n six lower p equals fifty three in all the first idea which will occur is that the relative smallness of the numbers in the lower line appears only in those kinships which are most difficult to trace through the female descent and that the apparent inferiority is in exact proportion to that difficulty thus the parentage of a man's mother is invariably stated in his biography consequently an eminent lower g is no less likely to be overlooked than a upper g but a lower u is more likely to be overlooked than an upper u and an lower n and lower p much more likely than an upper n and upper p however the solution suggested by these facts is not wholly satisfactory because the differences appear to be as great in the well-known families of the statesmen and commanders as in the obscure ones of literary and scientific men it would seem from this and from what i shall have to say about the divines that i have hunted out the eminent kinsmen in these degrees with pretty equal completeness in both male and female lines the only reasonable solution which i can suggest besides that of inheriting capacity of the female line for transmitting the peculiar forms of ability we are now discussing is that the aunts sisters and daughters of eminent men do not marry on the average so frequently as other women they would be likely not to marry so much or so soon as other women because they would be accustomed to a higher form of culture and intellectual and moral tone in their family circle than they could easily find elsewhere especially if owing to the narrowness of their means their society were restricted to the persons in their immediate neighbourhood again one portion of them would certainly be of a dogmatic and self-asserting type and therefore unattractive to men and others would fail to attract owing to their having shy odd manners often met with in young persons of genius which are disadvantageous to the matrimonial chances of young women it will be observed in corroboration of this theory that it accounts for lower g being as large as upper g because a man must have an equal number of lower g and upper g but he need not have an equal number of lower u lower n lower p and upper u upper n upper p owing to want of further information i am compelled to leave this question somewhat undecided if my column c of my tables had been based on facts instead of an estimate these facts would have afforded the information i want in the case of poets and artists the influence of the female line is enormously less than the male and in these the solution i have suggested would be even more appropriate than in the previous groups among the divines we come to a wholly new order of things here the proportions are simply inverted the female influence being to the male of seventy three to twenty seven instead of as in the average of the first five columns thirty to seventy i have already in the chapters on divines spoken at so much length about the power of female influence in nurturing religious dispositions that i need not recur to that question as regards the presumed disinclination to marriage among the female relatives of eminent men generally an exception must certainly be made in the case of those of the divines they consider intellectual ability and a cultured mind of small importance compared with pious professions and religious society is particularly large owing to habits of association for religious purposes therefore the necessity of choosing a pious husband is no maternal hindrance to the marriage of a near female relation of an eminent divine there is a common opinion that great men have remarkable mothers no doubt they are largely indebted to maternal influences but the popular belief ascribes an undue and incredible share to them i account for the belief by the fact that great men have usually high moral natures and are affectionate and reverential inasmuch as mere brain without heart is insufficient to achieve eminence such men are naturally disposed to show extreme filial regard and to publish the good qualities of their mothers with exaggerated praise i regret i am unable to solve the simple question whether and how far men and women who are prodigious of the means so and it will be seen from my point of view of that future of the human race as described in a subsequent chapter that the fertility of eminent men is a more important fact for me to establish than that of prodigies there are many difficulties in the way of discovering whether genius is or is not correlated with infertility one and a very serious one is that people will agree upon the names of those who are pre-eminently men of genius nor even upon the definition of the word another is that the men selected as examples are usually ancients at all events 
those who lived so long ago it is often and always very difficult to learn anything about their families another difficulty lies in the fact that the man who has no children is likely to do more for his profession and to devote himself more thoroughly to the good of the public than if he had them a very gifted man will almost always rise as i believe to eminence but if he is handicapped with the weight of a wife and children in the race of life he cannot be expected to keep as much in the front as if he were single he cannot have no other pressing calls on his attention so domestic sorrows anxieties and petty cares no yearly child no periodical infantile epidemics no constant professional toil for the maintenance of a large family there are other obstacles in the way of leaving descendants in the second generation the daughters would not be so likely as other girls to marry for the reasons stated a few pages back while the health of the sons is liable to be ruined by overwork the sons of gifted men are decidedly more precocious than their parents as a reference to my appendices will distinctly show i do not care to quote cases because it is a normal fact analogous to what is observed in diseases and in growths of all kinds as well as clearly laid down by mr darwin the result is that the precocious child is looked upon as a prodigy abler even than his parent because the parent's abilities at the same age were less and he is pushed forward in every way by home influences until serious harm is done to his constitution so much for the difficulties in the way of arriving at a right judgment on the question before us most assuredly a surprising number of the ablest men appear to have left no descendants but we are justified from what i have said in ascribing a very considerable part of the adducted instances to other causes than an inherent tendency to barrenness in men and women of genius i believe there is a large residuum which must be ascribed and i agree thus far with the suggestion of prosper lucas that as giants and dwarfs are rarely prolific so men of prodigiously large or small intellectual powers may be expected to be deficient in fertility on the other hand i utterly disagree with the assertion of that famous author on hereditary that true genius is invariably isolated there is a prevailing belief somewhat in accordance with the subject of the last paragraph but one that men of genius are unhealthy puny beings all brain and no muscle weak sighted and generally of poor constitutions i think most of my readers would be surprised at the stature and physical frames of the heroes of history who fill my pages they could be assembled together in a hall i would undertake to pick out any group of them even out of that of the divines see page two hundred and seventy two hundred and seventy one and eleven who should compete in any physical feats whatever against similar selections from groups of twice or thrice their number taken at haphazard from equally well-fed classes in the notes i made previous to writing this book i have begun to make memoranda of the physical gifts of my heroes and regret now that i did not continue the plan but there is even almost enough printed in the appendices to warrant my assertion i do not deny that many men of extraordinary mental gifts have had wretched constitutions but deny them to be an essential or even the usual accomplishment university facts are as good as any others to serve as examples so i will mention that both high wranglers and high classics have been frequently the first oarsmen of their years the honorary george denman who was senior classic in eighteen forty two was the stroke of the university crew sir william thompson the second wrangler in eighteen forty five won the skulls in the very first boat race between the two universities three men who afterwards became bishops rowed in one of the commanding boats and another rowed in the other it is the second and third-rate students who are usually weekly a collection of living magnates in various branches of intellectual achievement is always a feast to my eyes being as they are such massive vigorous capable looking animals i took some pains to investigate the law of mortality in the different groups and drew illustrative curves in order to see whether there was anything abnormal in the constitutions of eminent men and this result certainly came out which goes far to show that the gifted men consist of two categories the very weak and the very strong it was that the curve of mortality does not make a single bend but it rises to a minor culminating point and then descending again takes a fresh departure for its principal arc there is a want of continuity in the regularity of its sweep i conclude that among the gifted men there is a small class who have weak and excitable constitutions who are distant to early death and that the remainder consists of men likely to enjoy a vigorous old age this double culmination was strongly marked in the group of artists and distinctly so in that of poets but it came out with most startling definition when i laid out the cases of which i had made notes ninety-two in number of men remarkable for their precocity their first culmination was at the age of thirty-eight then the death rate sank to the age of forty-two 
At 52, it had again risen to what it was at 38, and it attained its maximum at 64. The mortality of the men who did not appear to have been eminently precocious, 180 cases in all, followed a perfectly normal curve, rising steadily to a maximum of 68 years, and then declining as steadily. The scientific men lived the longest, and the number of early deaths among them was decidedly less than in any of the other groups. The last general remark I have to make is that features and mental abilities do not seem to be correlated. The son may resemble his parent in being an able man, but it does not therefore follow that he will also resemble him in features. I know of families where the children who had not the features of their parents inherited their disposition and ability, and the remaining children had just the converse gifts. In looking at the portraits in the late national exhibitions, I was extremely struck with the absence of family likeness in cases where I had expected to find it. I cannot prove this point without illustrations. The reader must therefore permit me to leave its evidence in an avowedly incomplete form. In concluding this chapter, I may point out some of the groups that I have omitted to discuss. The foremost engineers are a body of men possessed of remarkable natural qualities. They are not only able men, but are also possessed of singular powers of physical endurance and boldness, combined with clear views of what can and what cannot be effected. I have included Watt and Stevenson among the men of science, but the Brunels, and the curious family of Myon, going back for nine, if not twelve generations, all able and many eminent in their professions, and several others deserve notice. I do not, however, see my way to making a selection of eminently gifted engineers, because their success depends, in a very great degree, on early opportunities. If a great engineering business is once established, with well-selected men in their heads and various departments, it is easy to keep up the name and credit for more than one generation after the death of its gifted originator. The actors are very closely connected, so much so as to form a cast. But here, as with the engineers, we have great difficulty in distinguishing the eminently gifted from those whose success is largely due to the accident of education. I do not, however, like to pass them over without a notice of the Kemple family, who filled so long a space in the eyes of the British world two generations ago. The following is their pedigree. A family tree is displayed on the page. I was desirous of obtaining facts bearing on hereditary from China, and there the system of examination is notoriously strict and far-reaching, and boys of promise are sure to be passed on from step to step until they have reached the highest level which they are capable. The first honour of the year, in a population of some 400 millions, the senior classic and senior wrangler rolled into one, is the Chuan Yan. Are the Chuan Yans ever related together? Is a question I have asked and to which a reply was promised to me by a friend of high distinction in China, but which has not reached me up to the time I am writing these lines. However, I put a question on the subject into the pages of the Hong Kong Notes and Queries, August 1868, and found, at all events, one case of a woman who, after bearing a child who afterwards became a Chuan Yang, was divorced from her husband, but marrying again. She bore a second child, who also became a Chuan Yang, to her next husband. I feel the utmost confidence that if the question were thoroughly gone into by a really competent person, China would afford a perfect treasury of facts bearing on hereditary. There is, however, a considerable difficulty in making these inquiries, arising from the paucity of surnames in China, and also from the necessity of going back to periods, and there are many such, when corruption was far less rife in China than it is at present. The records of the Olympian Games in the palmy days of Greece, which were scrupulously kept by the Ilians, would have been an excellent mind to dig into for facts bearing on hereditary but they are not now to be had however i find one incidental circumstance in their history that is worth a few lines of notice it appears there was a single instance of a married woman having ventured to be present while the games are going on although death was the penalty of the attempt she was found out but excused because her father brothers and sons had all been victors end of chapter nineteen Chapter 20 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings from the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 20. The Comparative Worth of Different Races. I have now completed what I have to say concerning the kinships of individuals, and proceed, in this chapter, to attempt a wider treatment of my subject through a consideration of nations and races. 
every long-established race has necessarily its peculiar fitness for the conditions under which it has lived owing to the sure operation of darwin's law of natural selection however i am not much concerned for the present with the greater part of those aptitudes but only with such as are available in some form or other of high civilization we may reckon upon the advent of a time when civilization which is now sparse and feeble and far more superficial than it is vaunted to be shall overspread the globe ultimately it is sure to do so because civilization is the necessary fruit of high intelligence when found in a social animal and there is no plainer lesson to be read off the face of nature than that of the result of the operation of her laws is to evoke intelligence in connection with sociability intelligence is as much an advantage to an animal as physical strength or any other natural gift and therefore out of two varieties of any race of animal who are equally endowed in other respects the most intelligent variety is sure to prevail in the battle of life similarly among animals as intelligent as man the most social race is sure to prevail other qualities being equal under even a very moderate form of material civilization a vast number of aptitudes acquired through the survivorship of the fittest and the unsparing destruction of the unfit for hundreds of generations have become as obsolete as the old mail coach habits and customs since the establishment of railroads and there is not the slightest use in attempting to preserve them they are hindrances and not gains to civilization i shall refer to some of these a little further on but i will first speak of the qualities needed in civilized society they are speaking generally such as will enable a race to supply a large contingent to the various groups of eminent men of whom i have treated in my several chapters without going so far as to say that this very convenient test is perfectly fair we are at all events justified in making considerable use of it as i will do in the estimates i am about to give in comparing the worth of different races i shall make frequent use of the law of deviation from the average to which i have already been much beholden and to save the reader's time and patience i propose to act upon an assumption that would require a good deal of discussion to limit and to which the reader may at first demur but which cannot lead to any error of importance in a rough provisional inquiry i shall assume that the intervals between the grades of ability are the same in all the races that is if the ability of class a of one race be equal to the ability of class c in another then the ability of class b of the former shall be supposed equal to that of the class d of the latter and so on i know this cannot be strictly true for it would be in defiance of analogy of the variability of all races were precisely the same but on the other hand there is good reason to expect that the error introduced by the assumption cannot sensibly affect the offhand results for which i alone i propose to employ it moreover the rough data i shall adduce will go far to show the justice of this expectation let us then compare the negro race with the anglo-saxon with respect to those qualities alone which are capable of producing judges statesmen commanders men of literature and science poets artists and divines if the negro race in america had been affected by no social disabilities a comparison of their achievements with those of the whites in their several branches of intellectual effort having regard to the total number of their respective populations would give the necessary information as matters stand we must be content with much rougher data first the negro race has occasionally but very rarely produced such men as to assent the overture who are of our class upper f that is to say its upper x or its total classes above upper g appear to correspond with our upper f showing a difference of not less than two grades between the blacks and white races and it may be more secondly the negro race is by no means wholly deficient in men capable of becoming good factors thriving merchants and otherwise considerably raised above the average of whites that is to say it cannot unfrequently supply men corresponding to our class upper c or even upper d it will be recollected that upper c implies a selection of one in sixteen or somewhat more than the natural abilities possessed by average four men of common juries and that upper d is as one in sixty four a degree of ability that is sure to make a man successful in life in short classes upper e and upper f for the negro may roughly be considered as the equivalent of our upper c and upper d a result which again points to the conclusion that the average intellectual standard of the negro race is some two grades below our own thirdly we may compare but with much caution the relative position of negroes in their native country with that of the travellers who visit them the latter no doubt bring with them the knowledge current in civilized lands but that is an advantage of less importance as we are apt to suppose 
A native chief has as good an education in the art of ruling men as can be desired. He is continually exercised in personal government, and usually maintains his place by the ascendancy of his character, shown every day over his subjects and rivals. A traveller in wild countries also fills, to a certain degree, the position of a commander, and has to confront native chiefs at every inhabited place. The result is familiar enough. The white traveller almost invariably holds his own in their presence. It is seldom that we hear of a white traveller meeting with a black chief, whom he feels to be the better man. I have often discussed this subject with competent persons, and can only recall a few cases of the inferiority of the white man, certainly not more than might be ascribed to an average actual difference of three grades, of which one may be due to the relative demerits of native education, and the remaining two to a difference in natural gifts. Fourthly, the number among the Negroes of those whom we should call half-witted men is very large. Every book alluding to Negro servants in America is full of instances. I was myself much impressed by this fact during my travels in Africa. The mistakes the Negroes made in their own matters were so childish, stupid, and simpleton-like as frequently to make me ashamed of my own species. I do not think it any exaggeration to say that their lower C is as low as our lower E, which will be a difference of two grades. As before, I have no information as to actual idiocy among the Negroes. I mean, of course, of that class of idiocy which is not due to disease. The Australian type is at least one grade below the African Negro. I possess a few serviceable data about the natural capacity of the Australian, but not sufficient to induce me to invite the reader to consider them. The average standard of the lowland Scotch and the English North Country men is decidedly a fraction of a grade superior to that of the ordinary English, because the number of the former who attain to eminence is far greater than the proportionate number of their race would have led us to expect. The same superiority is distinctly shown by a comparison of the well-being of the masses of the population, for the Scotch labourer is much less of a drudge than the English men of the Midland countries. He does his work better and lives his life besides. The peasant women of Northumberland work all day in the fields, and are not broken down by the work. On the contrary, they take pride in their efficiency labour as girls, and when married, they attend well to the comfort of their homes. It is perfectly distressing to me to witness the draggled, drudged, mean look of the mass of individuals, especially of the women, that one meets in the streets of London and other purely English towns. The conditions of their life seem too hard for their constitutions, and to be crushing them into degeneracy. The ablest race of whom history bears record is unquestionably the ancient Greek, partially because their masterpieces in the principal departments of intellectual activity are still unsurpassed, and in many respects unequalled, and partially because the population that gave birth to the creators of those masterpieces was very small. Of the various Greek sub-races, that of Attica was the ablest, and she was no doubt largely indebted to the following cause for her superiority. Athens opened her arms to immigrants, but not indiscriminately, for her social life was such that none but very able men could take any pleasure in it. On the other hand, she offered attractions such as men of the highest ability and culture could find in no other city. Thus, by a system of partially unconscious selection, she built up a, a magnificent breed of human animals, which, in the space of one century, viz. between 530 and 430 BC, produced the following illustrious persons, fourteen in number. Statesmen and commanders, Themistocles, Mother and Alien, Miltiades, Aristides, Simon, son of Miltiades, Pericles, son of Xanthippus, the victor of Michael, literary and scientific men, Thucydides, Socrates, Xenophon, Plato, poets, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, sculptor, Phidias. We are able to make a closely approximate estimate to the population that produced these men, because the number of the inhabitants of Attica has been a matter of frequent inquiry, and critics appear at length to be quite agreed in the general results. It seems that the little district of Attica contained during its most flourishing period Smith's Dictionary of Greek and Roman Geography, less than 90,000 native free-born persons, 40,000 resident aliens, and a labouring and artisan population of 400,000 slaves. The first item is the only one that concerns us here, namely the 90,000 free-born persons. Again, the common estimate that population renews itself three times in a century is very close to the truth, and may be accepted in the present case. 
Consequently, we have to deal with a population of 270,000 free-born persons, or 135,000 males, born in the century I have named. Of these, about one-half, or 67,500, would survive the age of 26, and one-third, or 45,000, would survive that of 50. As 14 Athenians became illustrious, the selection is only as 1 to 4, 822 in respect to the former limitation, and as 1 to 3, 214 in respect to the latter. Referring to the table on page 34, it will be seen that this degree of selection corresponds very fairly to the classes upper F, 1 in 4,300 and above, of the Athenian race. Again, as upper G is 1 16th or 1 17th as numerous as upper F, it would be reasonable to expect to find one of class G among the 14. We might, however, by accident, meet with 2, 3 or even 4 of that class, say Pericles, Socrates, Plato and Phidias. Now let us compare the Athenian standard of ability with that of our own race and time. We have no men to put by the side of Socrates and Phidias, because the millions of all Europe, breeding as they have done for the subsequent two thousand years, had never produced their equals. They are therefore two or three grades above our upper G. They might rank as upper I or upper J, but suppose we do not count them at all, saying that some freak of nature acting at that time may have produced them. What must we say about the rest? Pericles and Plato would rank, I suppose, the one among the greatest of philosophical statesmen, and the other as at least the equal of Lord Bacon. They would therefore stand somewhere among our unclassed upper X, one or two grades above upper G. Let us call them between upper H and upper I. All the remainder, the upper F of the Athenian race, would rank above our upper G, and equal or close upon our upper H. It follows from all this that the average ability of the Athenian race is, on the lowest possible estimate, nearly two grades higher than our own. That is, about as much as our race is above that of the African Negro. This estimate, which may seem prodigious to some, is confirmed by the quick intelligence and high culture of the Athenian commonality, before whom literary works were recited and works of art exhibited, of a far more severe character than could possibly be appreciated by the average of our race the calibre of whose intellect is easily gouged by a glance at the contents of a railway bookstall. We know and may guess something more of the reason why this marvellously gifted race declined. Social morality grew exceedingly lax, marriage became unfashionable and was avoided. Many of the more ambitious and accomplished women were avowed courtesans and consequently infertile, and the mothers of the incoming population were of a heterogeneous class. In a small sea-bordered country where emigration and immigration are constantly going on and where the manners are as dissolute as were those of Greece in the period of which I speak, the purity of a race would necessarily fail. It can be, therefore, no surprise to us, though it has been a severe misfortune to humanity, that the high Athenian breed decayed and disappeared. For if it had maintained its excellence and had multiplied and spread over large countries, displacing inferior populations, which it well might have done, for it was exceedingly prolific, it would assuredly have accomplished results advantageous to human civilization to a degree that transcends our power of imagination. If we could raise the average standard of our race by only one grade, what vast changes would be produced? The number of men of natural gifts equal to those of the eminent men of the present day would be necessarily increased more than tenfold, as will be seen by the fourth column in the table, page 34, because there would be 2,000 423 of them in each million instead of only 233. But far more important to the progress of civilization would be the increase in the yet higher orders of intellect. We know how intimately the course of events is dependent on the thoughts of a few illustrious men. If the first-rate men in the different groups had never been born, even if those among them who have had a place in my appendices on account of their hereditary gifts had never existed, the world would be very different to what it is. Now, the table shows that the numbers of these, in the loftiest grades of intellect, would be increased in a still higher proportion than that of which I have been speaking. Thus, the men that now rank under the class upper G would be increased seventeenfold by raising the average ability of the whole nation a single grade. We see by the table that all England contains, on the average, of course, of several years, only six men between the ages of thirty and eighty whose natural gifts exceed class upper G. But in a country of the same population as ours, whose average was one grade higher, there would be 82 of such men, and in another whose average was two grades higher, such as I believe the Athenian to have been in the interval 530 to 430 BC, 
no less than 1,355 of them would be found. There is no improbability that so gifted a breed being able to maintain itself, as Athenian experience rightly understood has sufficiently proved, and as has also been proved by what I have written about the judges, whose fertility is undoubted, although their average natural ability is up ref, or 5.5 degrees above the average of our own, and 3.5 above that of the average Athenians. It seems to me most essential to the well-being of future generations that the average standard of ability of the present time should be raised. Civilization is a new condition imposed upon man by the course of events, just as in the history of geological changes new conditions have continually been imposed on different races of animals. They have had the effect either of modifying the nature of the races through the process of natural selection, whenever the changes were sufficiently low and the race sufficiently pliant, or of destroying them altogether when the changes were too abrupt, or the race unyielding. The number of the races of mankind that have been entirely destroyed under the pressure of the requirements of an incoming civilization reads us a terrible lesson. Probably in no former period of the world has the destruction of the races of any animal whatever been effected over such wide areas and with such startling rapidity as in the case of savage man. In the North American continent, in the West Indian Islands, in the Cape of Good Hope, in Australia, New Zealand and Van Diemen's Land, the human denizens of vast regions have been entirely swept away in the short space of three centuries. Less by the pressure of a stronger race than through the influence of a civilization they were incapable of supporting. And we too, the foremost laborers in creating this civilization, are beginning to show ourselves incapable of keeping pace with our own work. The needs of centralization, communication and culture call for more brains and mental stamina than the average of our race possesses. We are in crying want for a greater fund of ability in all stations of life, for neither the classes of statesmen, philosophers, artisans, nor labourers are up to the modern complexity of their several professions. An extended civilization like ours comprises more interests than the ordinary statesmen or philosophers or our present race are capable of dealing with when it exacts more intelligent work than our ordinary artisans and labourers are capable of performing. Our race is overweighed, and appears likely to be drudged into degeneracy by demands that exceed its powers. If its average ability were raised a grade or two, our new classes, upper F and upper G, would conduct the complex affairs of the state at home and abroad as easily as our present, upper F and upper G, when in the position of country squires, are able to manage the affairs of their establishments and tenantry. All other classes of the community would be similarly promoted to the level of work required by the 19th century if the average standard of the race were raised. When the severity of the struggle for existence is not too great for the powers of the race, its action is healthy and conservative, otherwise it is deadly, just as we may see exemplified in the scanty, wretched vegetation that leads a precarious existence near the summer snow line of the Alps, and disappears altogether a little higher up. We want as much backbone as we can get, but bear the racket to which we are henceforward to be exposed and as good brains as possible to contrive machinery for modern life to work as smoothly than at present. We can, in some degree, raise the nature of man to a level with the new conditions imposed upon his existence, and we can also, in some degree, modify the conditions to suit his name. It is clearly right that both these powers should be exerted, with the view of bringing his nature and the conditions of his existence into a close harmony as possible. In proportion as the world becomes filled with mankind, the relations of society necessarily increase in complexity and the nomadic disposition found in most barbarians becomes unsuitable to the novel conditions. There is a most unusual unanimity in respect to the causes of incapacity of savages for civilization among writers on those hunting and migratory nations who are brought into contact with advancing colonization and perish, as they invariably do, by the contact. They tell us that the labor of such men is neither constant nor steady, that the love of a wandering, independent life prevents their settling anywhere to work, except for a short time, when urged by want and encouraged by kind treatment. Meadows says that the Chinese call the barbarous races on their borders by a phrase which means hither and thither, not fixed, and any amounts of evidence might be adduced to show how deeply bohemian habits of one kind or another were ingrained in the nature of the men who inhabited most parts of the earth, now overspread by the Anglo-Saxon and other civilized races. Luckily, there is still room for adventure, and a man who feels the cravings of a roving, adventurous spirit to be too strong for a resistance may yet find a legitimate outlet for it in the colonies, 
in the army or on board ship but such a spirit is on the whole a heirloom that brings more impatient restlessness and beatings of the wings against cage bars than persons of more civilized characters can readily comprehend and it is directly at war with the more modern portion of our moral natures if a man be purely a nomad he has only to be nomadic and his instinct is satisfied but no englishmen of the nineteenth century are purely nomadic the most so among them have also inherited many civilized cravings and are necessarily starved when they become wanderers in the same way as the wandering instincts are starved when they are settled at home consequently their nature is opposite wants which can never be satisfied except by chance through some very exceptional turn of circumstances this is a serious calamity and as the bohemianism in the nature of our race is destined to perish the sooner it goes the happier for mankind the social requirements of english life are steadily destroying it no man who only works by fits and starts is able to obtain his living nowadays for he has not a chance of thriving in competition for steady workmen if his nature revolts against the monotony of daily labour he is tempted to the public house to intemperance and it may be to poaching and a much more serious crime otherwise he banishes himself from our shores in the first case he is unlikely to leave as many children as men of more domestic and marrying habits and in the second case his breed is wholly lost to england by this steady riddance of the bohemian spirit of our race the artesian part of our population is slowly becoming bred to its duties and the primary qualities of the typical modern british workmen are already the very opposite of those of the nomad what they are now as well described by mr chadwick are consisting of great bodily strength applied under the command of a steadily preserving will mental self-contentedness impassivity to external irrelevant impressions which carry them through the continued repetition of toilsome labour steady as time it is curious to remark how unimportant to modern civilization has become the once famous and thoroughbred looking nomad the type of his features which is probably in some degree correlated with his peculiar form of adventurous disposition is no longer characteristic of our rulers and is rarely found among celebrities of the present day is more often met with among the undistinguished members of highly born families and especially among the less conspicuous officers of the army modern leading men in all parts of eminence as may easily be seen in a collection of photographs are of a coarser and more robust breed less excitable and dashing but endowed with far more ruggedness and real vigour such also is the case as regards the german portion of the austrian nation they are far more high caste in appearance than the prussians who are so plain that it is disagreeable to travel northwards from vienna and watch the change yet the prussians appear possessed of the greater moral and physical stamina much more alien to the genius of an enlightened civilization than the nomadic habit is the impulsive and uncontrolled nature of the savage a civilized man must bear and forbear he must keep before his mind the claims of the morrow as clearly as those of the passing minute of the absent as well as the present this is the most trying of the new conditions imposed on man by civilization and the one that makes it hopeless for any but exceptional natures among savages to live under them the instinct of a savage is admirably constant with the needs of savage life every day he is in danger through transient causes he lives from hand to mouth in the hour and for the hour without care for the past or forethought for the future but such as instinct is utterly at fault in civilized life the half reclaimed savage being unable to deal with more subjects of consideration than are directly before him is continually doing acts through mere maladramatis and incapacity at which he is afterwards deeply grieved and annoyed the nearer inducements always seem to him through his uncorrected sense of moral perspective to be incurably larger than others of the same actual size but more remote consequently with the temptation of the moment has been yielded to and passed away and its bitter result comes in its turn before the man he is amazed and remorseful at his past weakness it seems incredible that he should have done that yesterday which to-day seems so silly so unjust and so unkindly the newly reclaimed barbarian with the impulsive unstable nature of the savage when lie also chances to be gifted with a peculiarly generous and affectionate disposition is of all others the man most oppressed with the sense of sin now it is a just assertion and a common theme of moralists of many creeds that man such as we find him is born with an imperfect nature he has lofty aspirations but there is a weakness in his disposition which incapacitates him from carrying his nobler purposes into effect he sees that some particular course of action is his duty and should be his delight but his inclinations are fickle and base and do not conform to his better judgment the whole moral nature of man is tainted with sin 
which prevents him from doing the things he knows to be right. The explanation I offer of this apparent anomaly seems perfectly satisfactory from a scientific point of view. It is neither more nor less than that of the development of our nature, whether under Darwin's law or of natural selection, or through the effects of changed ancestral habits, has not yet overtaken the development of our moral civilization. Man was barbarous but yesterday, and therefore it is not to be expected that the natural aptitudes of his race should already have become moulded into accordance with his very recent advance. We, men of the present centuries, are like animals suddenly transplanted among new conditions of climate and of food. Our instincts fail us under the altered circumstances. My theory is confirmed by the fact that the members of old civilizations are far less sensible than recent converts from barbarism, of their nature being inadequate to their moral needs. The conscience of a negro is aghast at his own wild, impulsive nature, and is easily stirred by a preacher. But it is scarcely possible to ruffle the self-complacency of a steady-going Chinaman. The sense of original sin would show, according to my theory, not that man was fallen from a higher state, but that he was rising in moral culture with more rapidity than the nature of his race could follow. My view is corroborated by the conclusion reached at the end of each of the many independent lines of ethnological research, that the human race were utter savages in the beginning, and that, after my raids of years of barbarism, man has but very recently found his way into the paths of morality and civilization. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter Twenty One Influences that Affect the Natural Ability of Nations. Before speaking of the influences which affect the natural ability and intelligence of nations and races, I must beg the reader to bring distinctly before his mind how reasonable it is that such influences should be expected to exist, how consonant it is to all analogy and experience to expect that the control of the nature of future generations should be as much within the power of the living as the health and well-being of the individual is in the power of the guardians of his youth. We are exceedingly ignorant of the reasons why we exist confident only that individual life is a portion of some vaster system that struggles arduously onwards towards ends that are dimly seen or wholly unknown to us by means of the various affinities the sentiments the intelligences the tastes the appetites of innumerable personalities who ceaselessly succeed one another on the stage of existence there is nothing that appears to assign a more exceptional or sacred character to a race than the families or individuals that compose it we know how careless nature is of the lives of individuals we have seen how careless she is of eminent families how they are built up flourish and decay just the same may be said of races and of the world itself also by analogy of other scenes of existence than this particular planet of one of innumerable suns our world appears hitherto to have developed itself mainly under the influence of unreasoning affinities but of late man slowly growing to be intelligent humane and capable has appeared on the scene of life and profoundly modified its conditions he has already become able to look after his own interests in an incomparably more far-sighted manner than in the old prehistoric days of barbarism and flint knives he is already able to act on the experiences of the past to combine closely with distant allies and to prepare for future wants known only through the intelligence long before their pressure has become felt he has introduced a vast deal of civilization and hygiene which influence to an immense degree his own well-being and that of his children it remains for him to bring other policies into action that shall tell of the natural gifts of his race it would be writing to no practically useful purpose were i to discuss the effect that might be produced on the population by such social arrangements as existed in sparta they are so alien and repulsive to modern feelings that it is useless to say anything about them so I shall wholly confine my remarks to agencies that are actually at work, and upon which there can be no hesitation in speaking. I shall have occasion to show that certain influences retard the average age of marriage, while others hasten it, and the general character of my argument will be to prove that an enormous effect upon the average natural ability of a race may be produced by means of those influences. I shall argue that the wisest policy is that which results in retarding the average age of marriage among the weak, 
and in hastening it among the vigorous classes whereas most unhappily for us the influence of numerous social agencies has been strongly and painfully exerted in the precisely opposite direction an estimate of the effect of the average age of marriage on the growth of any section of a nation is therefore the first subject that requires investigation everybody is prepared to admit that it is an element sure to produce some sensible effect but few will anticipate its real magnitude or will be disposed to believe that its results have so vast and irresistible an influence on the natural ability of a race that i shall be able to demonstrate the average age of marriage affects population in a threefold manner firstly those who marry when young have the larger families secondly they produce more generations within a given period and therefore the growth of a prolific race progressing as it does geometrically would be vastly increased at the end of a long period by a habit of early marriages and thirdly more generations are alive at the same time among those races who marry when they are young in explanation of the aggregate effects of these three influences it will be best to take two examples that are widely but not extremely separated suppose two men m and n about twenty-two years old each of them having therefore the expectation of living to the age of fifty-five or thirty-three years longer and suppose that m marries at once and that his descendants when they arrive at the same age do the same but that n delays until he has laid by money and does not marry before he is thirty-three years old that is to say eleven years later than m and his descendants also follow his example let us further make the two very moderate suppositions that the early marriages of race m result in an increase of one point five in the next generation and also in the production of three point seven five generations in a century or the late marriages of the race n result in an increase of only one point two five in next generation and in two point five generations in one century it will be found that an increase of one point five in each generation accumulating on the principle of compound interest during three point seven five generations becomes rather more than eighteen over four times the original amount while an increase of one point two five for two point five generations is barely as much as seven over four times the original amount consequently the increase of the race of m at the end of a century will be greater than that of n in the ratio of eighteen to seven that is to say it will be rather more than two point five times as great in two centuries the progeny of m will be more than six times and in three centuries more than fifteen times as numerous as those of n the proportion which the progeny of m will bear at any time to the total living population will be still greater than this owing to the number of generations of m who are alive at the same time being greater than those of n the reader will not find any difficulty in estimating the effect of these conditions if he begins by ignoring children and all others below the age of twenty two and also by supposing the population to be stationary in its number in consecutive generations we have agreed in the case of m to allow three point seven five generations to one century which gives about twenty seven years to each generation then when one of this race is twenty two years old his father will on the average in many cases be twenty seven years older or forty nine and as a father lives to fifty five he will survive the advent of his son to manhood for the space of six years consequently during the twenty seven years intervening between each two generations there will be found one mature life for the whole period and one other mature life during a period of six years which gives for the total mature life of the race m a number which may be expressed by the fraction six plus twenty seven over twenty seven or thirty three over twenty seven the diagram represents the course of three consecutive generations of race m the middle line refers to that of the individual about whom i have just been speaking the upper one to that of his father and the lower to his son the dotted line indicates the period of life before the age of twenty two the double line the period between twenty two and the average time at which his son is born the dark line is the remainder of his life a graph is displayed on the page a term of twenty seven years between two generations on the other hand a man of the race n which does not contribute more than two point five generations to a century that is to say forty years to a single generation does not attain the age of twenty two until on the average of many cases seven years after his father's death for the father was forty years old when his son was born and died at the age of fifty five when the son was only fifteen years old in other words during each period of eighteen plus fifteen plus seven or forty years men of mature life at the rate's end are alive for only eighteen plus fifteen or thirty-three of them 
hence the total mature life of the race n may be expressed by the fraction thirty three over forty a graph is displayed on the page a term of forty years between two generations it follows that the relative population due to the races of m and n is as thirty three over twenty seven to thirty three over forty or as forty to twenty seven which is very nearly as five to three we have been calculating on the supposition that the population remains stationary because it was more convenient to do so but the results of our calculation will hold nearly true for all cases because if population should increase the larger number of living descendants tends to counterbalance the diminished number of living ancestry and conversely if it decreases combining the above ratio of five to three with those previously obtained it results that at the end of one century from the time when the races m and n started fair with equal numbers the proportion of mature men of race m will be four times as numerous as those of race n at the end of two centuries they will be ten times as numerous and at the end of three centuries no less than twenty-six times as numerous i trust the reader will realize the heavy doom which these figures pronounce against all subsections of prolific races in which there is the custom to put off the period of marriage until middle age it is a maxim of malthus that the period of marriage ought to be delayed in order that the earth may not be overcrowded by a population for whom there is no place at the great table of nature if this doctrine influenced all classes alike i should have nothing to say about it here one way or another for it would hardly affect the discussions in this book but as it is put forward as a rule of conduct for the prudent part of mankind to follow whilst the imprudent are necessarily left free to disregard it i have no hesitation in saying that it is a most pernicious rule of conduct in its bearing upon race its effect would be such as to cause the race of the prudent to fall after a few centuries into an almost incredible inferiority of numbers to that of the imprudent that it is therefore calculated to bring utter ruin upon the breed of any country where the doctrine prevailed i protest against the abler races being encouraged to do withdraw in this way from the struggle for existence it may seem monstrous that the weak should be crowded out by the strong but it is still more monstrous that the races best fitted to play their part on the stage of life should be crowded out by the incompetent the ailing and the desponding the time may hereafter arrive in far distant years when the population of the earth shall be kept as strictly within the bounds of number and suitability of race as the sheep on a well-ordered moor or the plants in an orchard house in the meantime let us do what we can to encourage the manipulation of the races best fitted to invent and conform to a high and generous civilization and not out of a mistaken instinct of giving support to the weak prevent the incoming of strong and hearty individuals the long period of the dark ages under which europe has lain is due i believe in a very considerable degree to the celibacy enjoined by religious orders on their votaries whenever a man or woman was possessed of a gentle nature that fitted him or her to deeds of charity to meditation to literature or to art the social condition of the time was such that they had no refuge elsewhere than in the bosom of the church but the church chose to preach an exact celibacy the consequence was that these gentle natures had no continuance and thus by policies so singularly unwise and suicidal that i am hardly able to speak of it without impatience the church brutalized the breed of our forefathers she acted precisely as if she had aimed at selecting the rudest portion of the community to be alone the parents of future generations she practised the arts which breeders would use who aimed at creating ferocious currish and stupid natures no wonder that sub law prevailed for centuries over europe the wonder rather is that enough good remained in the veins of europeans to enable their race to rise to its present very moderate level of natural morality a relic of this monastic spirit clings to our universities who say to every man who shows intellectual powers of the kind they delight to honour here is an income of from one to two hundred pounds a year with free lodging and various advantages in the way of board and society we give it you on account of your ability take it and enjoy it all your life if you like we exact no condition on your continuing to hold it but one namely that you shall not marry the policy of the religious world in europe was exerted in another direction with hardly less cruel effect on the nature of future generations by means of persecutions which brought thousands of the foremost thinkers and men of political aptitudes to the scaffold or imprisoned them during a large part of their manhood or drove them as emigrants into other lands in every one of these cases 
the check upon their leaving issue was very considerable hence the church having first captured all the gentle natures and condemned them to celibacy made another sweep of her huge nets this time fishing in stirring waters to catch those who were the most fearless truth-seeking and intelligent in their modes of thought and therefore the most suitable parents of a high civilization and put a strong check if not a direct stop to their progeny those she reserved on these occasions to breed the generations of the future were the servile the indifferent and again the stupid thus as she to repeat my expression brutalized human nature by her system of celibacy applied to the gentle she demoralized it by her system of persecution of the intelligent the sincere and the free it is enough to make the blood boil to think of the blind folly that has caused the foremost nations of struggling humanity to be the heirs of such hateful ancestry and that has so bred our instincts as to keep them in an unnecessarily long-continued antagonism with the essential requirements of a steadily advancing civilization in consequence of this inbred imperfection of our natures in respect to the conditions under which we have to live we are even now almost as much harassed by the sense of moral incapacity and sin as were the early convents from barbarism and we steep ourselves in half-unconscious self-deception and hypocrisy as a partial refuge from its instance our avowed creeds remain at variance with our real rules of conduct and we lead a dual life of barren religious sentimentalism and gross materialistic habitudes the extent to which persecution must have affected european races is easily measured by a few well-known statistical facts thus as regards metrodom and imprisonment the spanish nation was drained of free thinkers at the rate of one thousand persons annually for the three centuries between fourteen seventy one and seventeen eighty one an average of one hundred persons having been executed and nine hundred imprisoned every year during that period the actual data during those three hundred years are thirty two thousand burnt seventeen thousand persons burnt in effigy i presume they mostly died in prison or escaped from spain and two hundred ninety one thousand contemned to various terms of imprisonment and other penalties it is impossible that any nation could stand a policy like this without paying a heavy penalty in the deterioration of its breed as has notably been the result in the formation of the superstitious unintelligent spanish race of the present day italy was also frightfully persecuted at an earlier date in the diocese of como alone more than one thousand were tried annually by the inquisitors for many years and three hundred were burnt in a single year fourteen sixteen the french persecutions by which the english have been large gainers through receiving their industrial refugees were on a nearly similar scale in the seventeenth century three or four hundred thousand protestants perished in prison and the galleys for their attempts to escape or on the scaffold and an equal number emigrated mr smiles in his admirable book on the huguenots has traced the influence of these and of the flemish emigrants on england and shows clearly that she owes to them almost all her industrial arts and very much of the most valuable life-blood of her modern race there has been another emigration from france of not unequal magnitude but followed by very different results namely that of the revolution in seventeen eighty nine it is most instructive to contrast the effects of the two the protestant emigrants were able men and have profoundly influenced for good both our breed and our history on the other hand the political refugees had but poor average stamina and have left scarcely any traces behind them it is very remarkable how large a proportion of the eminent men of all countries bear foreign names and are the children of political refugees men well qualified to introduce a valuable strain of blood we cannot fail to reflect on the glorious destiny of a country that should maintain during many generations the policy of attracting eminently desirable refugees but not others and of encouraging their settlement and the naturalization of their children no nation has parted with more emigrants than england but whether she has hitherto been on the whole a gainer or a loser by the practice i am not sure no doubt she has lost a very large number of families of sterling worth especially of labourers and artisans but as a rule the very ablest men are strongly disinclined to emigrate they feel that their fortune is assured at home and unless their spirit of adventure is overwhelmingly strong they prefer to live in the high intellectual and moral atmosphere of the more intelligent circles of english society to a self-banishment among people of altogether lower grades of mind and interests 
England has certainly got rid of a great deal of refuse through means of emigration. She has found an outlet for men of adventurous and bohemian natures who are excellently adapted for colonizing a new country, but are not wanted in old civilizations, and she has also been disembarrassed of a vast number of turbulent radicals and the like, men who are decidedly able but by no means eminent, and whose zeal, self-confidence, and irreverence far outbalance their other qualities. The rapid rise of new colonies and the decay of old civilizations is, I believe, mainly due to their respective social agencies, which in the one case promote, and in the other case retard, the marriages of the most suitable breeds. In a young colony, a strong arm and an enterprising brain are the most appropriate fortune for a marrying man, and again, as women are few, the inferior males are seldom likely to marry. In an old civilization, the agencies are more complex. Among the active, ambitious classes, none but the inheritors of fortune are likely to marry young. There is especially a run against men of classes, upper C, upper D, and upper E, those, I mean, whose future fortune is not assured except through a good deal of self-denial and effort. It is almost impossible that they should succeed well and rise high in society if they hamper themselves with a wife in their early manhood. Men of classes upper F and upper G are more independent, but they are not nearly as so numerous and therefore their breed, though intrinsically of more worth than upper E or upper D, has much less effect on the standard of the nation at large. But even if men of classes upper F and upper G marry young, and ultimately make fortunes and achieve peerages or high social position, they become infected with the ambition current in all old civilizations of founding families. Thence result the evils I have already described in speaking of the marriages of eldest sons with heiresses and of the suppression of the marriages of the younger sons again there is a constant tendency of the best men in the country to settle in the great cities where marriages are less prolific and children are less likely to live owing to these several causes there is a steady check in an old civilization upon the fertility of the abler classes the improvident and unambitious are those who chiefly keep up the breed so the race gradually deteriorates, becoming in each successive generation less fitted for a high civilization, although it retains the external appearances of one, until the time comes when the whole political and social fabric caves in, and a greater or less relapse to barbarism takes place, during the reign of which the race is perhaps able to recover its tone. The best form of civilization in respect to the improvement of the race would be one in which society was not costly, where incomes were chiefly derived from professional sources and not much through inheritance, where every lad had a chance of showing his abilities, and, if highly gifted, was enabled to achieve a first-class education and entrance into professional life, by the liberal help of the exhibitions and scholarships which he had gained in his early youth, where marriage was held in as high honour as in ancient Jewish times, where the pride of race was encouraged, of course I do not refer to the nonsensical sentiment of the present day that goes under that name, where the weak could find a welcome and a refuge in celibate monasteries or sisterhoods, and lastly, where the better sort of emigrants and refugees from other lands were invited and welcomed, and their descendants naturalized. End of chapter 21「Hereditary Genius」by Francis Galton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings from the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 22 General Considerations It is confidently asserted by all modern physiologists that the life of every plant and animal is built up of an enormous number of subordinate lives that each organism consists of a multitude of elemental parts which are to a great extent independent of each other that each organ has its proper life or autonomy and can develop and reproduce itself independently of other tissues see darwin on domestication of plants and animals volume two page three hundred and sixty eight three hundred and sixty nine thus the word man when rightly understood becomes a noun of multitude because he is composed of millions perhaps billions of cells each of which possesses in some sort an independent life and is parent of other cells he is a conscious whole formed by the joint agencies of a host of what appear to us to be unconscious or barely conscious elements mr darwin in his remarkable theory of pangenesis takes two great strides from this starting point 
he supposes first that each cell having of course its individual peculiarities breeds nearly true to its kind by propagating innumerable germs or to use his expression gemules which circulate in the blood and multiply there remaining in that inchoate form until they are able to fix themselves upon other more or less perfect tissue and that they become developed into regular cells secondly the germs are supposed to be solely governed by their respective natural affinities in selecting their points of attachment and that consequently the marvellous structure of the living form is built up under the influence of innumerable blind affinities and not under that of a central controlling power this theory propounded by mr darwin as provisional and avowedly based in some degree on pure hypothesis and very largely on analogy is whether it be true or not of enormous service to those who inquire into hereditary it gives a key that unlocks every one of the hitherto unopened barriers to our comprehension of its nature it binds within the compass of a singularly simple law the multifarious forms of reproduction witnessed in the wide range of organic life and it brings all these forms of reproduction under the same conditions as govern the ordinary growth of each individual it is therefore very advisable that we should look at the facts of hereditary genius from the point of view which the theory of pangenesis affords and to this i will endeavour to guide the reader every type of character in a living being may be compared to the typical appearance always found in different descriptions of assemblages it is true that the life of an animal is conscious and that the elements on which it is based are apparently unconscious while exactly the reverse is the case in the corporate life of a body of men nevertheless the employment of this analogy will help us considerably in obtaining a clear understanding of the laws which govern hereditary and they will not mislead us when used in the manner i propose the assemblages of which i speak are such as are uncontrolled by any central authority but have assumed their typical appearance through the free action of the individuals who compose them each man being bent on his immediate interests and finding his place under the sole influence of an effective affinity to his neighbours a small rising watering place affords as good an illustration as any of which i can think it is often hardly possible to trace its first beginnings two or three houses were perhaps built for private use and becoming accidentally vacant were seen and rented by holiday folk who praised the locality and raised demand for further accommodation other houses were built to meet the requirement this led to an inn to the daily visit of the baker's and butcher's cart the postman and so forth then as the village increased and shops began to be established young artisans and other floating gemmules of english population in search of a place where they might advantageously attach themselves became fixed and so each new opportunity was seized upon and each opening filled up as soon or very soon after it existed the general result of these purely selfish affinities is that watering places are curiously similar even before the speculative builder has stepped in we may predict what kind of shops will be found and how they will be placed nay even what kinds of books and placards will be put up in the windows and so notwithstanding abundant individual peculiarities we find them to have a strong generic identity the type of these watering places is certainly a durable one the human materials of which they are made remain similar and so are the conditions under which they exist of having to supply the wants of the average british holiday seeker therefore the watering place would always breed true to its kind it would do so by detaching an offshoot of the fissiparous principle or like a polyp from which you may snip off a bit which thenceforward lives an independent life and grows into a complete animal or to compare it with a higher order of life two watering places at some distance apart might between them afford material to raise another in an intermediate locality precisely the same remarks might be made about fishing villages or manufacturing towns or new settlements in the bush or an encampment of gold diggers and each of these would breed true to its kind if we go to more stationary forms of society than our own we shall find numerous examples of the purest breed thus the hottentot kraal or village of to-day diners in no way from those described in the earliest travellers or to take an immensely longer leap the information gathered from the most ancient paintings in egypt accords with our observations of the modern life of the descendants of those peoples whom the paintings represent next let us consider the nature of hybrids suppose a town to be formed under the influence of two others that differ the one a watering place and the other a fishing town what will be the result we find that particular combination to be usually favourable because the different elements do not interfere with but rather support one another the fishing interest gives greater solidarity to the place than the more ephemeral presence of the tourist population can furnish the picturesque seaside life 
is also an attraction to visitors and the fishermen cater for their food on the other hand the watering place gives more varied conditions of existence to the fishermen the visitors are very properly mulked directly or indirectly for charities roads and the like and they are not unwelcome customers in various ways to their fellow townsmen let us take another instance of an hybrid one that leads to a different result suppose an enterprising manufacturer from a town of no great distance from an incipient watering hole discovers advantages in its minerals water power or means of access and prepares to set up his mill in the place we may predict what will follow with much certainty either the place will be forsaken as a watering place or the manufacturer will be in some way or other got rid of the two elements are discordant the dirt and noise and rough artisans engaged in the manufactory are uncongenial to the population of a watering place the moral i have in view will be clear to the reader i wish to show that because a well-conditioned man marries a well-conditioned woman each of pure blood as regards to any natural gift it does not in the least follow that the hybrid offspring will succeed i will continue to employ the same metaphor to explain the manner in which apparent sports of nature are produced such as the sudden appearance of a man of great abilities in undistinguished families mr darwin maintains in the theory of pangenesis that the gemmules of innumerable qualities derived from ancestral sources circulate in the blood and propagate themselves generation after generation still in the state of gemmules but fail in developing themselves into cells because other antagonistic gemmules are prepotent and overmaster them in the struggle for points of attachment hence there is a vastly larger number of capabilities in every living being than ever find expression and for every patient element there are countless latent ones the character of a man is wholly formed through these gemmules that have succeeded in attaching themselves the remainder have been overpowered by their antagonists count for nothing just as the policy of a democracy is formed by that of the majority of its citizens or as the parliamentary voice of any place is determined by the dominant political views of the electors in both instances the discontent minority is powerless let however by the virtue of the more rapid propagation of one class of electors say of an irish population the numerical strength of the weaker party is supposed to gradually increase until the minority becomes the majority then there will be a sudden reversal or revolution of the political equilibrium and the character of the borough or nation as evidenced by its corporate acts will be entirely changed this corresponds to a so-called sport of nature again to make the similes still more closely appropriate to our wants suppose that by some alteration in the system of representation two boroughs each containing an irish element and a large minority the one having always returned a weak and the other a conservative to be combined into a single borough returning one member it is clear that the whig and the conservative party will neutralize one another and that the union of the two irish minorities will form a strong majority and that a member professing irish interests is sure to be returned this strictly corresponds to the case where the son has marked peculiarities which neither of his parents possessed in a patent form the dominant influence of pure blood over moral alliances is also easily to be understood by the simile of the two boroughs for if every perfect and incolate voter in one of them that is to say every male man and child be a radical to his backbone the incoming of such a compact mass would overpower the dividing politics of the inhabitants of the other with which it was combined these similes which are perfectly legitimate according to the theory of pangenesis are well worthy of being indulged in for they give considerable precision to our views on hereditary and compel facts that appear anomalous at first sight to fall into intelligible order i will now explain what i presume ought to be understood when we speak of the stability of types and what is the nature of the changes through which one type yields to another stability is a word taken from the language of mechanics it is felt to be an apt word let us see what the conception of types would be when applied to mechanical conditions it is shown by mr darwin in his great theory of the origin of species that all forms of organic life are in some sense convertible into one another for all have according to his views sprung from common ancestry and therefore a and b having both descended from c the lines of descent might be remounted from a to c and redescended from c to b yet the changes are not by insensible gradations there are many but not an infinite number of intermediate links how is a law of continuity to be satisfied by a series of changes and jerks the mechanical conception would be that of a rough stone having in consequence of its roughness a vast number of natural facets on any of which it might rest in stable equilibrium that is to say when pushed it would somewhat yield 
when pushed much harder it would again yield but in a less degree in either case on the pressure being withdrawn it would fall back into its first position but if by a powerful effort the stone is compelled to overpass the limits of the face set on which it has hitherto found rest it will tumble over into a new position of stability when just the same proceedings must be gone through as before before it can be dislodged and rolled another step onwards the various positions of stable equilibrium may be looked upon as so many typical attitudes of the stone the type being more durable as the limits of its stability are wider we also see clearly that there is no violation of the law of continuity in the movements of the stone though it can only repose in certain widely separated positions now for another metaphor taken from a more complex system of forces we have all known what it is to be jammed in the midst of a great crowd struggling and pushing and swerving to and fro in its endeavour to make a way through some narrow passage there is a deadlock each member of the crowd is pushing the mass is agitated but there is no progress if by great effort a man drives those in front of him but a few inches forwards a recoil is pretty sure to follow and there is no ultimate advance at length by some accidental union of effort the deadlock yields a forward movement is made and the elements of the crowd fall into slightly varied combinations but in a few seconds there is another deadlock which is relieved after a while through just the same process as before each of these formations of the crowd in which they have found themselves in a deadlock is a position of stable equilibrium and represents a typical attitude it is easy to form a general idea of the conditions of stable equilibrium in the organic world where one element is so correlated with another that there must be an enormous number of unstable combinations for each that is capable of maintaining itself unchanged generation after generation i will now make a few remarks on the subject of individual variation the gemules whence every cell of every organism is developed are supposed in the theory of pangenesis to be derived from two causes the one unchanged inheritance the other changed inheritance mr darwin in his latter work variation of animals and plants under domestication shows fairly clearly that individual variation is a somewhat more important feature than we might have expected it becomes an interesting inquiry to determine how much of a person's constitution is due on an average to the unchanged gifts of a remote ancestry and how much in the accumulation of individual variations the doctrine of pangenesis gives excellent materials for mathematical formulae the constants of which might be supplied through averages of facts like those contained in my tables if they were prepared for the purpose my own data are too lax to go upon the averages ought to refer to some simple physical characteristic unmistakable in its quality and not subject to the doubts which attend the appraisement of ability let us remark that there need be no hesitation in accepting averages for this purpose for the meaning and value of an average are perfectly clear it would represent the results supposing the competing gemules to be equally fertile and also supposing the proportion of the gemules affected by individual variation to be constant in all the cases the immediate consequence of the theory of pangenesis is somewhat startling it appears to show that a man is wholly built up of his own and ancestral peculiarities and only in an infinitesimal degree of characteristics handed down in an unchanged form from extremely ancient times it would follow that under a prolonged term of constant conditions it would matter little or nothing what were the characteristics of the early progenitors of a race the type being supposed constant for the progeny would invariably be moulded by those of its more recent ancestry the reason for what i have just stated is easily to be comprehended if easy though improbable figures be employed in illustration suppose for the sake merely of a very simple numerical example that a child acquired one-tenth of his nature from individual variation and inherited the remaining nine-tenths from his parents it follows that his two parents would have handed down only nine-tenths of nine-tenths or zero point eight one from his grandparents zero point seven two nine from his great-grandparents and so on the numerator of the fraction increasing in each successive step less rapidly than the denominator until we arrive at a vanishing value of the fraction the part inherited by this child in an unchanged form from all his ancestors above the fiftieth degree would be only one five thousandth of his whole nature i do not see why any serious difficulty should stand in the way of mathematicians in framing a compact formula based on the theory of pangenesis to express the composition of organic beings in terms of their inherited and individual peculiarities and to give us after certain constraints have been determined the means of foretelling 
the average distribution of characteristics among a large multitude of offspring whose parentage was known the problem would have to be attacked on the following principle the average proportion of gemmules modified by individual variation under various conditions preceding birth clearly admits of being determined by observation and the deviations from that average may be determined by the same theory in the law of chances to which i have so often referred again the proportion of other gemmules which are transmitted in an unmodified form will be similarly treated for the children would on the average inherit the gemmules in the same proportion as they existed in their parents but in each child there would be a deviation from that average the table in page thirty four is identical with the special case in which only two forms of gemmules had to be considered and in which they existed in equal numbers in both parents if the theory of pangenesis be true not only might the average qualities of the descendants of groups a and b a and c a and d and every other combination be predicted but also the numbers of them who deviate in various proportions from their averages thus the issue of f and a ought to result in so and so for an average and in such and such numbers per million of a b c d e f g etc classes the latent gemmules equally admit of being determined from the patient characteristics of many previous generations and the tendency to revision into any ancient form ought also to be admit of being calculated in short the theory of pangenesis brings all the influences that bear on hereditary into a form that is appropriate for the grasp of mathematical analysis i will conclude by saying a few words upon what is to be understood by the phrase individuality the artificial breeding of fish has been the subject of so many books shows and lectures that every one has become more or less familiar with its processes the milt taken from the male is allowed to fall upon the ova that have been deposited by the female which thereupon rapidly change their appearance and gradually without any other agency an embryo fish may be observed to develop itself inside each of them the ova may have been separated for many days from the female the milt for many hours from the male they are therefore entirely detached portions of organized matter leading their own separate organic existences and at the instant or very shortly after they touch the foundations are laid of an individual life but where was that life during the long interval of separation of the milt and roe from the parent fish if these substances were possessed of conscious lives in the interim then two lives will have been merged into one individuality by the process which is a direct contradiction in terms if neither had conscious lives then consciousness was produced by an operation as much under human control as anything can be it may not be said that the ovum was always alive and the milt had merely an accessory influence because the young fish inherits its character from its parents equally and there is an abundance of other physiological data to disprove the idea therefore so far as fish are concerned the creation of new life is as unrestrictedly within the compass of human power as the creation of any material product whatever on the combination of given elements again suppose a breeder of fish to have two kinds of milt belonging to salmon of different character each in a separate cup a and b and two sorts of ova each also in a separate cup c and d then he can make this option the fish a c and b d or else the fish a d and b c therefore not only the creation of the lives of fish in a general sense but also the specific character of individual lives within wide limits is unrestrictedly under human control the power of the director of an establishment for breeding fish is of exactly the same quality as that of a cook in her kitchen both director and cook require certain elements to work upon but having got them they can create a fish or a dinner as the case may be according to a predetermined pattern now all generation is physiologically the same and therefore the reflections raised by what has been stated of fish are equally applicable to the life of man the entire human race or any one of its varieties may indefinitely increase its number by a system of early marriages or it may wholly annihilate itself by the observance of celibacy it may also introduce new human forms by means of the intermarriage of varieties and of a change in the conditions of life it follows that the human race has a large control over its future forms of activity far more than any individual has over his own since the freedom of individuals is narrowly restricted by the cost in energy of exercising their wills their state may be compared to that of cattle in an open pasture each tethered closely to a peg by an elastic cord these can graze in any direction for short distances with little effort because the cord stretches easily at first but the further they range the more powerfully does its elastic force pull backwards against them 
the extreme limit of their several ranges must lie at that distance from the peg where the maximum supply of nervous force from the chemical machinery of their bodies can evolve is only just equivalent to the outflow required to resist the strain of the cord now the freedom of humankind considered as a whole is far greater than this for it can gradually modify its own nature or to keep to the previous metaphor it can cause the pegs themselves to be continually shifted it can advance them from point to point towards new and better pastures over wide areas whose bounds are as yet unknown nature teems of latent life which man has large powers of evoking out of the forms and to the extent which he desires we must not permit ourselves to consider each human or other personality as something supernaturally added to the stock of nature but rather as a segregation of what already existed under a new shape and as a regular consequence of previous conditions neither must we be misled by the word individuality because it appears from the many facts and arguments in this book that our personalities are not so independent as our self-consciousness leads us to believe we may look upon each individual as something not wholly detached from its parent source as a wave that has been lifted and shaped by normal conditions in an unknown illimitable ocean there is decidedly a solidarity as well as a separateness in all human and probably in all lives whatsoever and this consideration goes far as i think to establish an opinion that the constitution of the living universe is a pure theism and that its form of activity is what may be described as cooperative it points to the conclusion that all life is single in its essence but various ever varying and interactive in its manifestations and that men and all other living animals are active workers and sharers in a vastly more extended system of cosmic action than any of ourselves much less of them can possibly comprehend it also suggests that they may contribute more or less unconsciously to the manifestation of a far higher life than our own somewhat as i do not propose to push the metaphor too far the individual selves of one of the more complex animals contribute to the manifestation of its higher order of personality End of chapter 22Appendix to Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Appendix The deviations from the average are given in the following table of M. Quetelet as far as 80 grades. They are intended to be reckoned on either side of the average and therefore extended over a total range of 160 grades. The 80th is a deviation so extreme that the chances of its being exceeded, upwards or downwards, whichever of the two events we please to select, is only 5,499,992 divided by 10 million equals 8 over 10 million, or less than 1 in a million. That is to say, when firing at a target, see diagram page 28 less than one out of a million shots taking the average of many millions will hit it at a greater height than eighty of quetelet's grades above the mean of all the shots and an equally small number will hit it lower than the eightieth grade below the same mean column m gives the chance of a shot falling into any given grade eighty multiplied by two or one hundred and sixty in total number column n represents the chances from another point of view it is derived directly from M and shows the probability of a short line between any specific grade and the mean. Each figure in N consisting of the sum of all the figures in M up to the grade in question and inclusive. Thus, as we see by column M, the chance against a short falling into the first grade, superior or inferior, whichever we please to select, is 0 0.025225 to 1 and 0 0.0 two five one two four to one against its falling into the second and zero point zero two four nine two four to one against its falling into the third then the chance against its falling between the mean and the third grade inclusive is clearly the sum of these three numbers or zero point zero seven five two seven three which is the entry in column m opposite the grade three table by quetelet is displayed on the page with 40 rows proceeding down from grade or rank of the group, column M, the probability of drawing each group, 
column M, sum of the probabilities commencing at the most probable group, number of the grade, M, probability of drawing each group, and N, sum of the probabilities commencing at the most probable group. These columns may be used for two purposes. The one is to calculate a table like that in page 34, where I have simply lumped 11 equivalence grades into one, so that my classes upper A and lower A correspond to his grade 11 in column N, my classes upper B and lower B to the difference between his grades 22 and 11, my upper C and lower C to that between his grades 33 and 22, and so on. The other is as a test whether or no a group of events are due to the same general causes because if they are their classification will afford numbers that correspond with those in the table otherwise they will not this test can be employed in page thirty thirty one and thirty three the method of conducting the comparison is easily to be understood by the following example in the figures of which i take from quetelet it seems that 487 observations of the right ascension of the polar star were made at Greenwich between 1836 and 1839, and are recorded in the publications of the observatory, after having been corrected for precision, nutation, etc., and subject only to errors of observation. If they are grouped into classes separated by grades of 0.5 seconds, the numbers in each of these classes will be as shown in column 3, page 380. We raise them in the proportion of 1,000, to 487 in order to make the ratios decimal and therefore comparable with the figures in Quetelet's table and then insert them in column 4. These tell us that it has been found by a pretty large experience that the chance of an observation falling within the class of 0.5 seconds from the mean is 150 to 1000, of its falling within the class of 1 second is 126 to 1000 and so on for the rest. This information is analogous to that given in column M of Quetelet's table, and we shall now proceed to calculate from 4 the column 5, which is analogous to Quetelet's N. The method of doing so is, however, different. N was formed by adding the entries of M from the average outwards. We must set to work in the converse way of working from the outside inwards, because the exact mean is not supposed to have been ascertained, and also because this method of working would be somewhat the more convenient, even if we had ascertained the mean. A table is displayed on the page with 10 columns displaying the classes, the range in each class, the number of observations in each class, events per 1000 by experience, probabilities derived from experience, corresponding grade in N, differences, revised grades, probabilities derived from calculation, and events per 1000 by calculation. Now, Wherever the mean may lie, it is certain that the chance is 500 to 1,000 against an observation being on one specific side of it, say the minus side. Therefore, column 4, by showing that no observation lies outside the class, 3.5 seconds, tacitly states that it is 500 to 1,000, or 0 0.500 to 1.00 against any observation lying between 3.5 seconds and the mean, 1.500 is therefore written in column 5, opposite 3.5 seconds. Again, as according to 4, there are only two cases in this class. 3.5 seconds, it is 500 minus 2 equals 498 to 1000, that any observation will lie between class 3 seconds and the average, and 0 0.498 is written in column 5, opposite to 3 seconds. Similarly, 498 minus 13 equals 486 is written opposite to 2.5 seconds, and we proceed in this way until we fall within the observations that form part of the group of the mean, 168 in number. A remainder is 68. It ought, strictly speaking, to be equal to one half of 168 or 84. We therefore may conclude that the mean has been taken a trifle too high. A calculation made in exactly the same way, from positive 3.5 seconds inwards to the mean, will take in the other portion of the main group, namely 100. Now we compare our results with Quetelet's column N, and see to which of his grades the number of now column 5 are severely equal. The grades in question are written in column 6. In proportion, these observations are strictly accordant with the law of deviation from the mean, so the intervals between the grades in column 6 will approach to equality. What they actually are is shown in column 7. We cannot expect the two extreme terms to be given results of much value because the numbers of observations are too few, but taking only the remainder in consideration, 
we find that the average interval of 6.5 is very generally adhered to. Now then, let us see what the numbers in the cases would have been by theory if starting either from 2.5, a little lower than 2.6, as we agreed it ought to be, above the average, or from 4 below it, we construct a series of classes according to Quetelet's grades having a common interval of 6.5. Column 8 shows what the classes would be. Column 9 shows the corresponding figures taken directly from Quetelet's N. And column 10 gives the difference between these figures, which are so closely accorded with the entries in column 4 as to place it beyond all doubt that the areas in the Greenwich observations are strictly governed by the law of a deviation from the average. It remains that I should say a very few words on the principle of the law of deviation from the average, or as it is commonly called, the law of errors of observations due to Laplace. Every variable event depends on a number of variable causes, and each of these, owing to the very fact of its variability, depends upon other variables, and so on, step after step, till one knows not where to stop. Also, by the very fact of each of these causes being a variable event, it has a mean value, and therefore it is, I am merely altering the phrase, an even chance, in any case, that the event should be greater or less than the mean. Now, it is asserted to be a matter of secondary moment to busy ourselves in respect to these minute causes, further than as to the probability of their exceeding or falling short of their several mean values, and the chance of a larger or smaller number of them doing so in any given case resembles the chance, well-known calculators, of the results that would be met with when making a draw out of an urn containing an equal quantity of black and white balls of enormous numbers. Each ball that is drawn out has an equal chance of being black or white, just as each subordinate event has an equal chance of exceeding or falling short of its mean value. I cannot enter further here into the philosophy of this view, the latest writer upon it in Mr. Crofton, in a paper read before the Royal Society in April 1869. A table, made on the above hypothesis, has been constructed by Coronot, and will be found in the appendix, page 267 of Quetelet's Letters on Probabilities, translated by Downs, Leighton & Co., 1849. But it does not extend nearly so far as that of M. Quetelet. The latter is calculated on a very simple principle, being the results of drawing 999 balls out of an urn containing black and white balls in equal quantities in enormous numbers. His grade number one is the case of drawing 499 white and 500 black, his two in 498 white and 501 black, and so on, the 80th being 420 white and 579 black. It makes no sensible difference in the general form of the results when these large numbers are taken, what their actual amount may be. The value of a grade will of course be very different, but almost exactly the same quality of curve would be obtained if the figures in Quetelet's or Cornet's tables were protracted. All this is shown by Quetelet in his comparison of the two tables. A table is displayed on the page with alphabetical list of the letters and the relationships to which they correspond. End of Appendix And the End of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton Recorded by Leon Harvey